Hello everybody, it's Michael Hollands for Son of the Movies. Today I have the pleasure to be joined by James Edward Barker. Besides being a multi-instrumentalist, James works as a composer, music and film producer who has produced such films as Precious Cargo, which he also wrote the music for. On top of that, he has established a profound collaboration with director Andrew Hay, who he recently worked with on the critically acclaimed film Lean on Pete, starring Charlie Plummer and Steve Buscemi. Welcome, James. Hello, how are you? I'm good, thank you very much. How are you? Thank you for joining me. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Great, you're welcome. Good to have you. Uh, James, before we dive into uh, Lean on Pete, one of the most recent projects um, I would like to know more about um, the time in your life when you decided um, that you wanted to write for a film and how it all started and came about sure um, well I mean I started teaching myself music um, around the age of um, nine uh, when I was about nine years old I started teaching myself guitar my mom's uh, guitar that she had uh, you know, just playing around, writing songs, uh, and then I was very lucky to be bought uh, a few uh, guitar effects pedals when I was about 13, and an electric guitar, and uh, I, I don't think I came out of my room for a couple of years because I was just so obsessed with uh, <laughs> messing around, <laughs> messing around with sounds. Uh, I can't remember what, I think it was a flanger, a delay, and a wah pedal, and I was just, yeah, I was... Uh, I was obsessed with them, and I would do everything from blowing up four tracks to soloing over the top of Guns N' Roses and B.B. King uh, and Eric Clapton and, and all the greats. Um, and, uh, and, and, I, and I'd been obsessed with film for a long time, um, you know, as long as I can remember, really. I mean, back then, um, you know, you had to cycle to get a video at the weekend, you know, whereas nowadays you can just download some on iTunes. Back then it was a real sort of family treat to, uh, you know, to, to, to rent out a video for the weekend. I remember I'd cycled to the village shop, which was a few miles away with my brother. And, uh, you know, we would choose um, a couple of videos, um, try and get the most naughty ones we could, you know, try and get some scary horror film that our parents wouldn't let us get. And uh, just come back and veg out and watch them. And I, I remember being obsessed with film soundtracks from a young age. I would record, you know, everything from Jaws and Indiana Jones to sort of weirder movies like Beetlejuice. Um, you know, just obsessed with just the way music could change the way you look at a film. Um, but I guess I never, I never really thought back then that I would sort of put music and film together um i always thought you had to be um you know beyond middle age to be a film composer um and so i started out um messing around in a few bands and and recording um my father was very good friends with uh, a good friend of mine's father a guy called charlie andrew um who back then was starting out uh, working as an engineer at abbey road studios and in his downtime, I would go there and we would start messing around with uh, recording different sounds and, and, you know, recording myself playing various instruments there. Um, and and then I joined a band in Newcastle for a couple of years. Um, but it sort of got to the point where I was on my knees money-wise and I was trying to work out what to do. And um, I ended up trying to uh, get into writing music for adverts because I thought that was going to be a lot easier than getting into film, I guess, back then. Um, and I got by for a bit, you know, doing a few adverts, um, but sending out loads and loads of demos. And um, finally, uh, me and a guy called Tim Despic, who I'd been putting some um, other demos together with, we'd sent out a few, um, you know, uh, p compilations, and we got a cold call from a film producer, a guy called Neil Peplo. Um, who said he'd heard a couple of our pieces and he loved them and would we consider writing a film score for him? And I guess the rest is history. <laughs> That's how I like um, Previously you mentioned you know, Jaws and Indiana Jones. Are there any uh, composers that you 
idolize personally? I mean, um, like John Williams, Rick Goldsmith, or is there any primary influence from those guys? Uh, yeah, I think I think I think Christopher Young, like the first person who I really sort of um, became extremely interested in was Christopher Young. Oh, yeah. um, I I love the way uh, Chris and I and I went and met. Chris um, on one of my first visits to LA and it was amazing his studio is is really cool um, he's obsessed with with pumpkins um, <laughs> and, and, and <laughs> so he has every single type of pumpkin toy you can imagine um, and uh, but uh, yeah I love the way he wasn't afraid to use sort of non what what you wouldn't call traditional instruments you know everything from kids toys to you know, whatever he could get his hands on. He wasn't afraid to use that to create any sort of sound in his scores. Um, and so I really, I loved that um, side of Chris's work. And I guess there was an a, what I call an electroacoustic vibe to some of his work. You know, there were soundscapes in there, which I was very much obsessed with, especially um, after I went to sort of become classically trained at Newcastle University, I, I got my first sort of computer and I and I just spent you know days and weeks and months messing around with creating sounds and that was the first time I'd heard a film composer use those sort of things in a film score and I love that. Um, so Chris Young, uh, Danny Elfman, you know, was a big one as well. Uh, I mean, as much as I love John Williams' work and the big scores and you know his theme tunes are incredible. Um, Danny Elfman just felt very different. I've always I've always loved the bizarre and the odd um, and the left field. And, and Danny Elfman always felt like he was pushing boundaries with his work, especially with his stuff with Tim Burton. Yeah, um, totally. Yeah. So but, those two I'd pick out. Yeah. Elfman is very innovative in, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, you know, sort of finding yeah. finding themes and, as you said, you know, or push, pushing boundaries. And you know, he's a very, very good composer. <laughs> yeah, totally. And, and, you know, the... The number of um, uh, you know uh, time signature changes um, and key changes and, and all those things that he incorporates into one small piece of music, but then enables it to sound so coherent and thematically aligned at the same time is incredible. I think. Absolutely, James. Um, as I understand, you are primarily based in the UK, right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, did you ever consider um, moving to um, to Los Angeles to um, you know work there primarily? Yeah, I like to think I'm I'm part of the longest move ever to Los Angeles. I've been trying now for about eleven years, <laughs> uh, but um, but my wife uh, was wasn't wasn't as keen. We did try for a bit. We tried um, uh, during it was during the house crisis crash actually like around 2008 um we tried and then we tried again in 2011 but it just it just didn't seem to work with us at the time um and uh yeah but i'm still trying uh and you know i, I do spend a lot of time in los angeles i you know i work I, I do still work there i have a visa and um yeah i uh you know i've done a number of films both on the composing side and the producing side there. So, um, yeah, I do love it. I do love it in Los Angeles. I feel very at home there. Um, and I love the sun. <laughs> yeah. Sounds great. Uh, as you just mentioned, the, um, film producing side, you produced, um, precious cargo, for instance, a film starring, you know, Bruce Willis, which you also wrote the music for, by the way. Um, how do you, how do you actually, balance you know not only producing a film but also writing the score for it yeah sure um well um i mean i'm primarily i'm a you know i'm a film composer and really the i fell into producing because i started to have a number of relationships with directors and i was just trying to i also had people who i knew um historically who were in finance or, or in producing and I was putting those people together and then you know those directors were asking me to come on board to help out you know on set and on a producing capacity as well um, I mean with 
you know, in the last few years, I you're right, I produced Precious Cargo and I produced a film called Mara. Um, and those I produced with um, Scott Mann. Um, and so, you know, we were, we were able to share duties. Scott worked as second unit director on those films as well. So, you know, when he needed to do um, his work, I, you know, I picked up um, the slack and, and when I needed to compose, he sort of picked up the slack. So that sort of worked well. Um, you know, it's, I guess it's always good to have a partner in, in, you know, whatever venture sure. you're in, um, in terms of producing. Um, I've set up a new company now called A Bright Headache uh, Films, and uh, I've got a few um, other partners who I've started to produce with. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, you know, but as I said, like, it's, it's, you know, you have to, you have to try and find a way to balance it all. Uh, you have to, you know, my, in my experience, you, you kind of have to work with partners, but yeah, like music is my focus, um, overall. So that's, that will sort of always, I guess, come first. Um, James, if I'm not mistaken, there is no physical release of the Precious Cargo score. Um, no, there hasn't been actually, um, I'm trying to remember why. I can't remember. <laughs> I, I think it was something to do with whoever had the publishing on that, and I'm trying to remember who had the publishing on that. Um, yeah, I can't remember. It was because it was um, Scott and I produced it with a company called EFO Films, um, Rand Lemon and George Furler. And I can't remember who had the publishing on that. Um, so yeah, th there wasn't a, there wasn't a release of the score. There will be a release of film score Mara when that comes out. Um, through um, a guy called Simon Fawcett, his company, uh, Atlantic Screen. So they'll be putting out a soundtrack later on this year. Great. James, um, now I would like to um, dive right into um, Lean on Pete, one of your most uh, recent yep. recent projects, and very criti critically acclaimed as well. Uh, how did you get involved with the production of this independent film? Sure. So uh, um, the film is produced by a guy called Tristan Golliger um, and obviously directed by Andrew. And I I knew Tristan as we were both leaving university. Uh, Tristan at the time was working in a trio of film directors, um, you know, trying to get into directing and, and he was doing music videos. And he shot my band's first music video. Um, so that's how I met Tristan. And then um, he started a company and he asked me to do a couple more things. And then when he produced his first feature film called Crack Willow, which was directed by a guy called Martin Radich, um, Tristan um, brought me in for an interview to do the score. And Martin and I got along. And so I started doing the score. And the editor of that film was Andrew. Um, Andrew had been in LA for a while. Um, I don't know exactly how long. I think it would. I think it was you know three or four years, if not longer. Um, and uh, he had been assistant editing and editing on some quite big films. You know, some pretty big sort of Hollywood movies actually. Um, and then he come over, come back to the UK, and he was editing on this film for which was produced by Warp Films as well as Tristan. Uh, and it was a really bizarre film. Um, it, it was it was awesome for me because it enabled me to get out all my guitar pedals and just go crazy with sort of ambience and um, that grey area between music and sound, which I love, um, and create what I can only describe as sort of what sounded like Aphex Twin being put through a blender. Um, it was it was really quite hardcore. Um, and very fun to do, um, very dark project. Um, and then off the back of that, Andrew and Tristan, uh, Andrew then directed his first short film, I think it was, called Five Miles Out, which Tristan produced. And it was, I think I'm right in saying, it was the last and most expensive film made under, made under the Cinema Extreme Shorts program, which was funded by the UK Film Council at the time. And it was like a fifty thousand pound short, um, and it was um, a really amazing drama. Um, 
I don't want to ruin it, um, but it was a, about a boy that goes uh, meets a meets a girl in a campsite and they spend their days uh, swimming, trying to get further into a cave um, in a cove. Um, but it, it was a little bleak. Um, but it, again, it enabled me to be in that sort of fairly dark, um, you know, space where you know between sort of music and sound that grey area. Um, so that's when I first worked with Andrew as, as a director, and then Andrew went and worked on. Andrew made his first feature film, which was a very low budget docudrama called Greek Pete, um, which was um, about a London rent boy. And um, I think I was the only other crew involved in that film. It was because Andrew wrote, directed, edited, produced it all on his own. And then I helped with some of the sound and then I did some music for him. Uh, and then off the back of that, Tristan produced Weekend and Andrew directed that and I came in and wrote a score for that and then Andrew uh, made the very bold decision of not wanting any score on it um, so in the end um, uh, we decided, you know, he decided not to use the score um, but it was fine I got paid and he was apologetic <laughs> and, uh, and then he obviously went and made 45 years and then uh, and then Lean on Pete came along um, and I heard about it and I called up um, well I tried to get in touch with Andrew but Andrew was away shooting you know busy because he was doing like a 50 day shoot or something uh, and so I you know emailed Tristan and Tristan um, asked me for my latest music I've been doing and I sent that into Andrew and um, before I knew it um, I've been called in to the editing room um, and uh, it was a lovely shock to see that Andrew had tempted up a lot of my a lot of his film with with my music, um, and yeah, it was a very organic process. And and before I knew it, I was on the film. So, James, what do you think is most important when working with filmmakers? Um, uh, trust, communication. Um, Patience. I think um, that from what's really important as a composer um, when when working with a producer is that the producer gives you enough time and uh, preferably enough money to achieve what the director wants. Uh, you know, I've been in a couple of embarrassing situations where the director's tempt up his very low budget film with Hans Zimmer and then the producer sort of offers you a few peanuts and you're like, well, <laughs> you just tempt up the score with Hans Zimmer, which costs a lot of money. <laughs> 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 so what do we do here? Uh, so, so yeah, you know, there's got to be a sense of realism, I guess, you know, how do we achieve what we want to achieve? Um, and then with the director, yeah, it's it's communication. It's um, it's it's a balance of egos. You know, if you don't know the director, you know, there's always that time where you're trying to feel each other out. Um, yeah. You know, you know what what does this guy want and how does he work? Um, and you know, some directors. You know, I've been in a situation where I haven't even seen the cut of a film, and the director's like, "Go away and write me the score," and. And I've been in situations where, you know, they've edited to no music, which 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 is both scary but extremely liberating because, you know, you you'd be given that trust. And then I've been in the complete opposite situation where they've tempt up a film and they're so married to the temp that you know, there's even if you even miss out a symbol hit, you know, over a certain sequence they're noticing and they're asking you where that symbol is. So that's, that can be quite tricky sometimes. Uh, yeah. But you know, it's, it, it's, it's trust, you know, and there have been times where I'm convinced I'm right. And, you know, but they're the director. So you bite your tongue and, and then I'm like, I saw, you know, I see the finished film and I'm like, actually, you know what? They were right all along. So yeah, you, yeah. You, at the end of the day, they are the director and um, you know, if they are first timers, 
or, or actually that's not true if, if, whatever, whoever the directors are you know you do try and say oh, I think this would work but you know at the end of the day if they you know they are the director and if they say this is what they want then that's you know what you need to give them um, and you need to try and find a way to work with them on, on that so those are the important things it's difficult yeah. in terms of temp music I think there are many pros and also many cons on that and um, yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah. Temp music is is yeah can be the bane of of a composer's life. I think like I I always try um, as much as I do go in and sometimes see scenes. You know they want me to see scenes. Once I get the first cut of the film, I do ask if there's any way I can watch it with no temp music because I always feel that you will never get that chance back again. You'll never get that chance. To watch the music, to watch the film with no music and have yeah. a completely, um, you know, just just let your mind run free. Do you know what I mean? With no sort of anchors to any particular direction. And sure. sure. Yeah. So yeah. So ninety uh, percent of directors are cool with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think in, at at some point you just feel that directors or producers have become so attached to um, temp score that uh, at the end of the day it's hard to you know convince them that a different approach might be more appropriate it's i think i mean i'm not in the position to um you know make those calls you know I, I'm, I'm not a trained musician or composer but i believe it's so tremendously difficult to find a common ground and just say well I think your what you suggested here with a temp might work, and I might you know write a cue which is comparable, and you know it's pretty difficult, I believe. Yeah, like it, it, there have been there have been so many different situations where um, you know with different results from. Different directors I work with, different temps they use, different attitudes towards the temp, and, and you know there've been some occasions where the you know they said go away and, and sort of try a different direction, and you do, and it doesn't work, and yeah, there's, but yeah, it, it, it is difficult with temp, but in in general, I've managed to, I've always managed to find a way to to make it work. Um, yeah, that, I mean, at the end of the day, that's our job. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, did you have any temp on Lean on Pete? Yeah, so about I think about seventy percent of the temp was was me, was my own music that okay. Andrew, yeah, that that I'd provided Tristan with the sort of music that I imagined would be good tonally. Like it wasn't it wasn't really. I don't think there was anything that was like what we ended up with but i think just in terms of setting the tone like the instrumentation changed um but but yeah there was there were a few bits that they edited um like jonathan the editor had had you know got a load of my tracks and and, and had done a great job of, of weaving them in and out um I'm, i can't remember what the other pieces were now um it feels like such a long time ago um because i think it was it was September 16 that I first got sort of went into you know meet with Tristan about the film and then Andrew. Um, so yeah. Do you think there is any or do you have a favorite sound or instrument um, that you feel reflects your own personality the most? I don't know really. Like I guess I mean for me I I love. I love working in a musical way with sounds. So, um, you know, what what I've done on Lean on Pete, um, you know, as much as I love um, heart wrenching melodies and big action scores and, and scaring the head out of people with um, with horror scores, the stuff I've done on Lean on Pete, I am ridiculously proud of. Um, it, it is it is very atmospheric, but at the same time, it's also really experimental. And I loved. I guess you become attached to to experiences, um, 
and um, the experience I had doing it with Pete was amazing. Uh, Tristan had budgeted, um, you know, a lot of time for me to to work on the score, um, and I was able to go. You know, Andrew had given me a lot of trust to workshop with the musicians, uh, and we had a lot of fun doing it. Um, it was a very organic process. Like it kept changing. Like even after we recorded, we were stripping stuff out or adding stuff in. Um, but I think, yeah, I think like working with sounds, like using my guitar, I've got a ridiculous collection of guitar pedals and I love sort of trying to find things that people haven't found before. Um, I think I still believe that there are ways in which we can use instruments and create sounds that we haven't heard before. You know, we might have heard certain chord changes a number of times in our lives and through different musicians, but I still think there are ways we can surprise people. And I think, I, um, totally, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I'm very proud with, with what I did on Lean on Pete in that way. So, How much score did you actually write for the picture? So I think, um, well, the the first the first approach we took was much more melodic. Um, it was a melancholic, melodic approach, and so I wrote probably about twenty five thirty minutes of music, and then we decided that it should be much more um, sort of atmospheric based. With like we could still have like hooks of sounds, and there are a few chord changes in there um, which I use on my um, like chords on it through a guitar pedal um, but when we changed the direction I ended up then writing probably about 45 minutes of score um, and then it wasn't until it wasn't until they were in the mix like because Andrew had signed off on stuff and then it wasn't until in the mix I think you know once they put everything together with Joachim sound, sound design um, which was amazing um, and Joachim was really great to work with. Um, if I am correct, you have also previously worked as a sound editor. Um, did you feel that this came in handy when you were working on the music for Lean on Pete, as it was rather atmospheric as opposed to thematic? Um, yeah, like I've like I've always been obsessed with with sound, and I guess just on a few films in the past. Um, you know, when people have needed an extra pair of hands, I've just jumped in and, and said, yeah, I, you know, I can help out here and et cetera. Um, but, uh, like, it, you know, the, that gray area between sound and music, you know, my previous knowledge obviously definitely helped me with Leon Pete, but I didn't, I didn't get involved as such in the sound design, um, you know, because that was very much Yo Kim's um, department. And I wouldn't want to tread on his toes. Um, but he, Joachim and I were brought together very early on. And, you know, we, we definitely talked about um, the ways in which we were going to approach our departments, um, you know, our jobs. And so, you know, we were always keeping each other in check. You know, I can think of a number of occasions throughout the post-production where he and I called each other out and we would have... Um, you know, long chats about it, which was great actually, because I don't. There's, there's sometimes there can be a slight. You know, we were, I was talking about battle of egos before. There can sometimes be a battle of egos between the sound department and the music department, um, and 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 on this job, that definitely wasn't there, and and it was really amazing to be able to work you know, and talk to Yoko about that sort of thing. I guess I get very enthusiastic about that, you know, sound and music working together. So sometimes when we don't, I get disappointed. So on this one, it was really great that we did. Okay. Um, where did you actually actually uh, record the music for Lean on Pete? I recorded it um, in uh, Urchin Studios in, in North London in Hackney. So um, I was talking earlier on in this interview about my old childhood friend of called Charlie Andrew, who, after Abbey Road, went on to become a very successful music producer. He produces all of Alt J's work, the um, alternative English rock band. Um, and uh, 
he does he's been doing a lot of my um film scores for a while and he he knew of urchin uh sort of studios um he, he knew the guys there so he and his management sorted that out um and charlie's wife um kirsty who they actually met at one of my film score recording um sessions uh, a long time ago uh, she is an incredible uh violinist and viola player um, and she she's been doing all my music fixing and then plays the lead you know viola and violin on, on all my film scores so she was there with her crew as such and she arranged all the musicians um, and we uh, we had a great string section uh, we had a, um, a brass section um, you know with trombones and horns and bass trombones and uh, we had an incredible percussionist, Dan, who was willing to experiment loads. You know, we we tried to bow everything as possible. As, you know, in fact, I tried to bow everything. Uh, so we had bowed singing bowls. We had bowed cymbals. Uh, we had the bowed vibraphone, which was a real last-minute decision to incorporate, and it was amazing. And it ended up being one of the things that Andrew loved and kept repeating throughout the score because i noticed he and Joachim edited a lot of uh the vibraphone to be repeated in parts where it wasn't originally intended to be uh which was great but they fell in love with it as much as me i think if if i can i'm going to try and do both vibraphone every score i do from now on because it's it's such a beautiful sound um but yeah we were trying to bow as much as possible because i wanted to hear that horse's hair on 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 everything i i i became slightly obsessed with um using you know using instruments in different ways and uh trying to create these uh fragile sort of washes of sounds uh and with the string players you know i wanted them to to play their notes like so soft like soft as possible so that we literally heard the bow beginning to touch the strings, almost bouncing on the strings. And then when they sort of remove the bow at the end of the note, we're hearing it sort of slightly disconnect. So the ends of the notes are broken. I wanted it to be so fragile um, because, you know, as much as Charlie is, the, you know, uh, Charlie obviously plays Charlie in the film, but Charlie, the character in the film, uh, as much as he, uh, you know, we learn that he is a very resilient boy against all the odds that are thrown at him. Uh, he's, he's still very, you know, he, he, there's a very fragile side to him. And and that's what I was trying to accentuate in in a lot of uh, the stream playing. Uh, which aspects and or characters um, of the film did you find you know most inspiring and where, were there any key scenes for you that you know sparked your first ideas um i guess for me the i mean well the whole score ended up being written from like because really the, the, a lot of andrews well andrews films in general they, they follow one particular character through a particular piece of and time you know particular period of time um and uh you know so this film obviously follows charlie and so i never took the score away from being um about charlie or for charlie i never wrote for other characters it was um it was just about how charlie was reacting um or acting with those other characters um so, yeah, so everything was from Charlie's perspective. So there wasn't, you know, any melodies that, you know, indicated other sort of characters coming in and out of the film. But I guess the first piece that I started um, writing for, which which is the first piece in the film now, but back then it wasn't. Um, it was probably like tr piece, track, so three or four. Um, but it's when uh, he first watches Pete race um, and Pete wins the race, and then they, they're walking down uh, the, the paddock, um, and you know the queue is called paddock, and uh, 
yeah, that's that's the first piece that I wrote for, and then that weaves uh, it time jumps across sort of three sections. Really, um, you then see Dell and Charlie talking in a truck. Um, Charlie gets his first bit of money, and then he ends up sleeping in the back of the truck under the stars, and ends up talking to Pete. Um, and it's such a lovely sort of continuation of scenes next to each other, um, and it just became really easy to go up here. Um, and I, that that key was relatively untouched from from when I first sort of wrote it to what it ended up being in the mix. As I understand, there are also a couple of songs you used um, throughout the film. Um, were you also involved in uh, you know, deciding which songs were going to be used and um, and, in, and in which scene? Uh, no, I wasn't. Um, like. I had when I when I first sort of got introduced to the team, I sat down with Yoki and sounds I am with Connie, um, who is the music supervisor, um, who's fantastic. Um, we've since worked on another project um, together. Actually, since seen on Pete, but she's amazing, uh, and uh, she was in charge of, of choosing all the songs with Andrew. Um, but uh, yeah, they did an amazing job. That the last song that is used, um, which is a version of uh, the R.K. song, um, uh, The World's Greatest. Uh, it, it, yeah, it still makes me cry, even though I know it's going to come. Uh, I still cry every time of that. It's an amazing choice. Um, and Charlie's acting, Charlie Plummer's acting in that scene, incredible. Um. I also you know, watched the trailer of Lean on Pete, which is very well edited, and uh, uh, the music was also very emotional in the in the trailer. Did you actually write the music for the trailer, or did they put it in the trailer? Or can you tell me about that? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's interesting actually because the the music, the, yeah, the music in the U.S. trailer, um, none of that is mine. But then they just released the U.K. trailer. And I noticed that the middle section is my music. Um, so I couldn't tell you exactly where, but roughly, it pretty much roughly. I think there's three acts to the UK trailer, and mine is the middle, the middle act of the music there. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure which scores they've used um, in the US trailer. Uh, it's funny actually. Whoever I've spoken to who's seen the film, they, they. I think a lot of people were expecting a different type of movie, a movie you know, a lot, um, a much more um, easygoing film. Um, you know, one that you don't really have to work at in terms of viewing and in terms of emotional, you know. I think they're expecting a softer, uh, more, in inverted commas, Hollywood film, um, where, you know, Andrew really expects audiences to engage with his film and, and, and work, you know, and to work a bit at, um, you know, their engagement with the film. And, and it is it is a much harsher film than I think people are expecting. Um, and maybe that's maybe that's what A24's little trick up their sleeve, you know. they. But I don't know. But, yeah, it's funny that a lot of people I've spoken to have said that it, it gave an impression of a very different type of movie. I think the UK one is slightly more, uh, slightly more melancholic. Um, UK trailer, but yeah, it's interesting. Um, James, what was the um, situation like in terms of musical budget? As this is an independent film, what are your recollections of that? Uh, the musical budget, for, uh, the musical budget for this film was good. Um, you know, it was uh, Tristan, as well as you know, budgeting time, you know, there was enough uh, money to do what we needed to do, which was, you know, to, to work with musicians. And it also gave me enough time to workshop with those musicians. So, you know, we spent, uh, you know, uh, you know, days working with um, different sets of musicians. You know, the, I separated the uh, strings from you know, the brass and uh, the brass from the percussion. Uh, and then, you know, I spent a lot of time recording my own stuff. Um, 
you know, I got involved in the percussion, but also the guitars and uh, all the pedals and everything. So yeah, like I, it, it was great. It, you know, I really couldn't fault anything to do um, with the budget or time on this movie. You know, compared to compared to other films. So yeah. Okay. Um, is there gonna be a soundtrack release? You know, combining songs and your score. Uh, there isn't going to be a combined release. Um, I don't think there's going to be a soundtrack as such, you know, with just the songs. But there is going to be a soundtrack of just score. And it was uh, it was meant to come out last week, but there was a problem with the masters. But the masters have now been done. I heard them and they sound amazing. Uh, I'm really happy with them. And uh, that was done by Chaz. And um, it is coming, I think it's coming out um, either the end of this week or the beginning of next week. Um, so in terms of your listeners, that will be roughly around the 16th of April. So. Great. Um, how extensive was the mixing process on this one? Uh, it was pretty extensive. Um, and, uh, yeah, I probably spent... Because there were, because there were so many different types of sounds and... Um, you know, I probably spent after after recording. I probably spent uh, two days just setting up the edits with Charlie in London. Then I came back and I edited for maybe ten days to two weeks, and then I mixed for probably maybe eight or nine days on my own, and then I went and mixed with Charlie for uh, back up in London at his Iguana Studios, which is where he does all his all J stuff and everything, uh, for another 10 days. So, right, I was just going to say, actually, Michael, one, one great thing about the, the mixing side of this film was that um, they had budgeted a lot of time um, for the actual mix of the film. Uh, you know, I think they spent like maybe three and a half three and a half weeks or four weeks overall, like not all at the same time. Uh, I think Andrew, I think they mixed for like two and a half weeks and then they took some time out and then came back and reviewed it, you know, after like a couple of weeks and then they spent another week and then they took some more time out and then they came back. It was a really, it was really cool to watch on the sidelines that, um, especially on a British film, they took so much pride in, you know, spending the time and mix it because, a lot of time, you know, low budget films unfortunately yep. don't get don't get that time to do that. So totally, uh, James. What's what's next for you? What are you currently working on, or what do you got going on in the future? <laughs> sure. So I just did. Um, so what have I finished? So at the end of last year, I did a film called Dead on Arrival um, for a director called Stephen Seffer, who. Uh, wrote a film called Heist, which I also wrote the music for, which was, Heist was directed by a, film, uh, by a director called Scott Mann, and then Scott directed a film at the end of last year called Final Score, which uh, is a big action film um, with Pierce Brosnan and Dave Bautista. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a bit like Olympus has fallen stroke die hard on the rock inside a football stadium. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And it was very fun. It was a big score, and I co-wrote that with uh, Tim Despick, who I mentioned earlier on in in the interview, which I did my first, who I did my first film with. Uh, and it, I also co-wrote Dead on Arrival with him actually as well. Um, uh, but I'm about to start a horror film, which I've literally just signed the contract on about two hours ago. So I'm going to start that Great. Um, week. Um, which I can't say what it is yet, um, but it is it is for the same some of the same financiers who are behind Lean on Pete. So. Great, um, James. Is there anything else you would like to to add? Um, what else can I add? Um, I don't know really. If you're interested in finding out more, you can follow me on Twitter. Sure, <laughs> James sure. And, uh, yeah, like, yeah, that's kind of it, really. Right. James, um, I would like to thank you 
for for taking so much time out of your out of your schedule. It was really a pleasure to talk to you. Um, I hope you enjoyed our conversation as well. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. Uh, I thank you, and I sure hope we get to reconnect in the future and, and talk again soon about various other projects. And thank you very much, and I hope you have a nice day. Thank you very much, Michael. Take care of yourself. Bye, James. Cheers.